welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this episode of the Future Money Podcast. Very excited to be here with you all. And as you all know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of finance and the future of money. And to do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have this one-on-one conversation among crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. Uh, if you like the show, if you want to give a little favor to us on the show, if you like the show, make sure to subscribe and you'll be not only notified when a new episode is out, but also this will enable more people to discover the show. A five-star rating goes a really, really long way, so thank you in advance. And also, I want to, before I introduce my guest today, I really want to thank you all really from the bottom of my heart, uh, really for all the support of my latest book. Uh, my latest book that just got released, uh, The Book of Crypto, really became the number one uh, new release in financial services globally on Amazon. It also just made it also on the top 10 best-selling list in financial services. Really big thank you. It took me over two and a half years to write that book. It was pretty much my big thing I was doing during COVID. Uh, and really, thank you very much for this, uh, for the great support. I really, really appreciate it. The Book of Crypto. And a big thank you not only to all you all, but also to my publisher, Pelgrim McMillan, and everybody that was helpful throughout the process. Very, very excited to share with you all. Um, my guest today uh, is Mr. J. James Stickland, the CEO of Elwood Technologies. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about everything about trading technology, software, what, what's happening on trading systems, markets. Uh, by the way, one thing about James that you probably don't know is that when he's not busy running Elwood and, and uh, focusing on crypto markets, he has four kids. So he's probably busy driving them around across the city on their different activities. James, great to have you today, today with us on the Future of Money podcast. Thank you, Henry. Appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on, and, and again, congrats on the book. Uh, an incredible read. Thank you very much. Thanks for the support. And by the way, for those who can't see or are watching us on YouTube today, you can see Brian James's great Bitcoin logo, great artifact there. So here you go. I love that you're presenting uh, today. Um, James, before we jump right in, there's a lot of questions I want to ask about the state of trades, trading systems, the market infrastructure. Can you share more about your personal journey and, you know, from where you were and how you ended up in crypto? And we'll talk about Elwood right after that. Yeah, look, so I, I've been involved in in crypto uh, either as a as an investor or as a sponsor, and 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 certainly not as a voyeur since probably sort of 2015, 16. Um, you know, at the bank. Uh, so I've been at places like J.P. Morgan and HSBC, um, who, whilst on the covers back in that period, were were not particularly visible supporters of the asset class. Um, you know, have always been incredibly engaged at trying to understand how they can facilitate the support of it. Um, so yeah, we were we were helping with you know, treasury functions, and we were helping with you know funding opportunities, etc. You know, really to try and help you know the early stages and the early auspices of the institutional engagement. Um, so I've been involved in it a long time, um, uh, and and equally got more deeply involved in it directly. Um, you know, through my involvement with uh, with Alan Howard and the team um, back in uh, November of 2020. Very exciting. Actually, actually talking about Alan Howard, can you tell us more about Elwood, like the history of Elwood, what it does? I think a lot of people don't know about the very interesting story behind the Elwood. And then also, what, what does Elwood do? What does Elwood Technologies focus on? Yeah, well, look, um, you know, Alan, uh, you know, this, I'm sure he won't mind me saying, you know, kind of woke up um, in, in 2017 and, and got as smart as he could. Um, you know, he was, uh, he was told by, uh, by a, a close friend that he needed to get involved in digital assets. And and anyone that knows Alan, he's a you know incredibly uh, you know kind of diligent human, and, and and basically immersed himself in as much reading as he possibly could. Um, came out of a you know a sort of darkened room, and, and basically said, "I need to be involved in the asset class." Um, and and then, then hence the sort of birth of Elwood, and and Elwood was really built as a trading arm um, for Alan to be involved in the asset class. Um, in absence of there there being you know, institutional grade technology at that point, and, you know, not to, to sort of, you know, toot our horn on it, um, decided that the best thing to do would, would be to build it. So, so in absence of there being really, you know, available technology to be able to trade the asset class in all the standard ways that you'd expect, you know, FX and commodities and equities, you know, built a platform to actually trade on. So, so that was the origination of, uh, of Elwood back in 2017. That's amazing. And can you maybe uh, share what does Elwood focus on now? Because obviously there's been a lot of reiterations you mentioned from 2017 till now. Like, 
today, like what what is the Elwood offering? What does it what does the com- what does the company focus on? Yeah, and, and I, I think that you know because the market was still in you know kind of finding its feet in this asset class through those you know early early periods. Obviously, the the rise and growth of the retail involvement. Um, Elwood actually launched a. Uh, an index business, um, you know, which was in conjunction with Invesco to really allow enterprises to have some exposure to digital assets without without actually having to hold the underlying. It, originally, it was an index based on on equities, with those equities having large, significant digital exposure. Um, that was one of the sort of foundations of, of Elwood alongside the trading business. Um, in 2020. Alan and I were, were, were looking at the sort of opportunities, um, you know, of digital. And obviously, again, he's been prolific in this space, as you've seen with his interviews. Um, and we really felt that the technology that was underpinning that trading activity, um, you know, would be a technology company. Um, and it would be, you know, a real opportunity for us to externalize that to the market. And, and really what that is, um, to your earlier question, is it's an order management, it's an execution management, and it's a portfolio management software, which sounds ridiculously boring um, and and probably is ridiculously boring. Um, but again, with the sort of immaturity of the infrastructure that surrounds crypto still and this, this continued evolution, you know, for institutions to really be become ever present and, and to put the volumes and, and the flows into this market that we all want, you know, we need technology to underpin that. So, so Elwood was really built on those foundations. And before we drive dive into release of the OMS, PMS, and EMS you just mentioned, maybe for the benefit of our audience, can you explain what is a portfolio management system, what is an order management system, and what is an execution management system in a crypto context? Again, just maybe for by way of background for our listeners, obviously these are uh, trading tools are very common traditional markets, but there's some particularities in crypto. James, if you can give a quick summary of the three elements and what role they play for any uh, uh, fund that is trading crypto, for example. Yeah, no, look, that, it's a good question, Henry. And, and basically, the, and sorry to use too much vernacular, um, uh, you know, kind of analogies and vernacular on this, but the reality is um, the execution management capabilities um, of digital assets and crypto is very different to, to the traditional markets. Um, you know, we, we're connecting to, you know, 30 plus different venues and, and they're all different. Um, and that's not the, sta- the same in traditional finance. You know, a lot of these venues and exchanges don't have testing environments. You know, you're testing with real money. Um, And again, that doesn't happen in traditional finance. The way that the the APIs are being connected, the rate fills, um, the volumes that that can be derived and and driven through the system, they're all very, very, very different. And and predominantly because a lot of the infrastructure was built on on a retail base. So now we're starting to see these enormous you know, flows and activities, the what, you know, what is clearly a very, um, you know, evolved asset class needs to have the infrastructure to catch up. So, you know, Elwood's basically been building technologies to supplement some of those failings uh, and some of that immaturity so that we can actually drive the, the activity and the volume that the market would expect having come in from traditional finance. And again, that sort of leads on to the portfolio management. Now, we're very much a digital ledger, um, you know, so, you know, not to sort of overshoot our skis in terms of what we are, but again, that's still very missing in this market space. So, you know, the ability to be able to reconcile and actually have a true reflection of your asset classes, which if you're a hedge fund or if you're a bank, um, you know, or if you're a digital native, you know, now that uh, we're finding LPs actually investing in these funds, they're demanding complete kind of transparency, complete execution and transaction um, activity, which can't really be captured on Google Sheets or, you know, insert name of other Excel based spreadsheets. So, yeah, we're trying to bring that capability and that experience of traditional markets into crypto. And, and it's very interesting because, as you mentioned, uh, one thing that always surprises me is actually how in the market today, there are not many firms doing what you guys do, right, on uh, providing a PMS, uh, EMS, or, uh, and OMS services, whereas in traditional finance, I mean, there's dozens of competitors in the space. It's, it's very interesting. Can you maybe share with us, why do you think there aren't more technology firms offering PMS, OMS, EMS services? Is it because these are difficult to build? Is it because there's not enough knowledge of the space? Uh, is it because the asset class is new? What, what do you think are the reasons why we don't have uh, a ample supply of providers offering such services? Look, I, I think there are a few uh, few reasons. One, it's it's just really difficult, right? You know, and that sounds like a very flippant statement, but it is very different. You know, there are 
you know, numbers of firms that have tried to migrate their FX technologies into digital and crypto. And we've, we've seen the sort of success ratios on, on, on that front. You know, it doesn't particularly hold itself um, in the same capabilities. There's 14 decimal places. There's rate fill challenges. There's a variety of different, um, you know, fundamentally different assets and, and facets that, that exist in crypto that, that don't exist in traditional um, asset classes. I think that also couples with really the sort of macro, you know, events and timings of, of crypto's, you know, mass explosion in 2020 and 2021 um, as it kind of came back. And, and look, there's a variety of reasons which I'm sure we all would agree or disagree on why it's come back at such a prolific rate. But it caught software vendors out, right? You know, the ability for you know existing traditional finance software companies to have this capability when they were thinking it was going to be another, you know, three years, five years, you know, seven years, et cetera. So it not only caught out the institutional uh, investors and, and clients for utilization, but it caught the software vendors out. So that coupled with the experience and the knowledge um, that already exists, I think are three kind of real fundamental reasons why it doesn't exist today. Now, it's not to say it won't in the future, but obviously that's our job to keep, you know, driving forward the, the quality of the technology. This podcast is brought to you by Bullish. Bullish is a powerful new exchange for digital assets that offers deep liquidity, automated market making, and state-of-the-art security. Follow Bullish on Twitter or visit bullish.com to learn more. Please note that digital assets and cryptocurrencies are high-risk products. Consult your professional advisor before dealing in them. Bullish's services are available in select locations only and not to U.S. persons. Visit bullish.com for important information and risk warnings. And when you look at the crypto, the state of crypto market infrastructure today, obviously now we discussed about the trading systems, but where do you think we are? Let's say on a scale from one to 10, 10 being very advanced and one being there's nothing around. Where do you think we stand now on a spectrum of, of crypto market structure, infrastructure more broadly? Look, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm an optimist on everything, but I'm a, probably a realist or a pessimist in, in some of these areas, but we're, like, we're probably at a five or a six. Um, you know, that, that's a worry, clearly, um, because, you know, we want stability, we want, um, you know, standardization, because that kind of helps a lot of this, um, you know, evolution and growth. Um, but the good news is uh, the rate at which this can evolve is exponentially faster than traditional finance. So where we've seen, you know, evolution in technology take, you know, five, 10 years, um, you know, to really come to the fore. Um, you know, the reality is in, in, in this asset class and because of the passion of people involved in it, it's happening in, you know, you know, divide that by seven in terms of its speed, right? So, you know, crypto is like dog years, as we know. Um, and so I think that the passion and the urgency is also here. So whilst it's lower on the scale than, than it should be, I think the ability for us to catch up is actually, you know, in a pretty good order. And what do you think is the the verticals of the broader infrastructure that are missing? Is it really trading systems? Is it exchanges becoming more institutional? Is it broader liquidity? Uh, is it, you know, what is really think the element that, that you think is missing the most in the broader market inf infrastructure? Look, I think that there's a there's you know there's a there's a real awakening when people enter the market from traditional finance that this is still pre-funded. Um, I think that there's a there's shock and awe in a lot of uh, people's faces that they can't just roll in with with uh, you know enabled credit, you know, and there are obviously you know you know kind of you know moves underway from a lot a lot of the crypto venues and, and exchanges and liquidity providers to provide some of that credit. Let's see if that continues with this sort of market turbulence at the current time. Um, but the reality is, you know, we're missing prime. Um, you know, and again, these are the sorts of you know, boring elements of, and apologies, anyone in prime, um, boring elements of the market that, that are necessities for actual, you know, driving flow and driving action. So I think that supplementing this market with, with flow will enable more, sorry, with, with prime will enable more flow, will enable more action. So if we can take out some of the complexities on pre-funding, I think that helps everybody in the market. You know, as somebody who's worked many years in prime brokerage, I won't take offense, uh, offense at that, uh, James. But actually, which brings back, brings back to the question I want to ask you. I mean, we obviously are missing proper, real prime brokerage right now in crypto. Uh, what do you think is missing? Why? How? When do you think we'll have real prime brokerage in crypto? And what could be the catalyst for us to have real prime brokerage in crypto? Yeah, look, I think it will be a phased approach. I think, you know, providing credit is is certainly the, the, the first phase to this. You know, so most people don't necessarily want 
long tail prime services like it, that exist in traditional finance today. You know, they want, you know, T plus one, T plus two, maybe even T plus five type, you know, kind of periods to actually, you know, hold, um, you know, credit so that they can execute quickly. And this is all about speed and efficiency, right? So the ability to be able to provide those short term kind of credit cycles and, and obviously derive, you know, significant, you know, interest for that, you know, I think is the first phase. I think it will become more complex over time. I think people will be, you know, using the opportunities of multi-day rolling, you know, strategies like, you know, that exist in, in Prime today. Um, and I think that the collateralization of this market will, will also start to erode uh, or the need for collateralization will start to erode as people get more comfortable with the counterparties they're working with. And then it will be working on a standardization again. So we know Bank X is good for credit. We know Bank Y is good for credit. And hopefully you know, they will enter the foray as well in terms of offering their existing uh, prime services into crypto. This episode is brought to you by CoinFlex.us, the first and only crypto exchange where you can trade with zero fees and earn interest with the world's first interest earning stablecoin called FlexUSD. FlexUSD pays interest on chain every eight hours directly into the user's wallet. No staking required. Follow CoinFlex underscore US on Twitter and sign up on CoinFlex.us to learn more today. And, and who do you think will be the crypto prime brokers of the future? Do you think they'll be the crypto firms, crypto native firms who will get into, you know, the crypto exchanges of today who are, we have custody and they all enter the market? Or do you think it'll be the traditional prime brokers who will add crypto to their, uh, uh, you know, aura of, of instruments that they already uh, offer to clients? Look, I think it will be, you know, worldly uh, and, and hideously political answer, but I think it will cross in the middle. Um, and, and, it, and it will have to cross in the middle because if you think of the banks being ready to offer prime, actually, that's probably a good way for them to enter the market because it's providing balance sheet, right? They understand the risk profiling. They understand the credit profiling that's required to be able to derive that service. So them putting money to work on digital and crypto with institutional clients is a great way for them to enter. It's a low risk way for them to enter. Um, but equally, they're still getting skilled on crypto and digital. So I think there is an absolute role for the independent uh, and there's an absolute role for the, for the, you know, for the small guy in this, as it were, the, 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 you know, the David versus the Goliath. And in many instances, you know, Goliath is providing the balance sheet for David to go and win. So the skill and the experience will sit with David um, in this instance to use the, uh, the analogy further. And then it will be underpinned and powered by the balance sheet of the institutional clients. You know, it's very interesting because I even talk about this in my book where even if we look at the state of crypto prime brokers today, a lot of the elements that we take for granted in traditional prime brokers, cross-portfolio margining, how the risk is looked at across the book, these things even don't even exist now in crypto prime brokers. Actually, the term is used very uh, in a very liberal fashion, but actually when you dig down a bit of what's, what's in the market today, it's literally a custody solution and there's a... A brokerage solution and we're just calling a prime, uh, you know, because it's very cute, but that's actually not the case, right? I'm sure it's something you, you've you seen as well in the market, right? Yeah, look, very much so. So I think, you know, like you say, there's there's an opportunity for people to have, you know, POA over uh, over assets so that they can at least see, you know, the, the balance of, of people's, um, you know, kind of credit facility or their, their balance statement facility. Cross margining still yet to arrive here. Um, you know, so we're, we're still very much at the foothills of, of providing some of these services that will really enable the, you know, true prime. I think it's, you know, it's a little unfair to sort of say, uh, you know, that people are offering full end to end prime services because it's still maturing, right? Um, but I think it gives people comfort when they're entering from traditional markets that there are prime services available for them to offer. So yeah, there's a lot of, um, POA ownership. There's a lot of collateralization that still exists today. There's a lot of short-term credit either on the venue or the exchange. And I think as we're getting smarter, um, you know, there will be full end-to-end -end prime certainly in the next 12 months. So James, obviously for a lot of these prime brokers we're talking about, the main clients are hedge funds. Obviously, you're having a lot of discussions with the crypto hedge funds and traditional hedge funds. What is the feedback you're getting from traditional hedge funds? Are they looking at entering the space? What's the sentiment? Is it something now finally they're happy to enter? If if yes, why? If not, why not? Yeah, look, I think that there's very much you know appetite for the for the traditional hedge funds to enter the market. I think you know, that's been growing over the last few years. You know, we were running a, a report. Uh, that sort of showed the sentiment and, and sort of moved towards, you know, uh, involvement from the traditional hedge funds and, and asset managers. 
you know, we're now sort of talking up to 10% of, of AUMs being deployed into this space. So I think the numbers, you know, bear out, uh, you know, positively in terms of the direction of trend. I think people see the margin opportunity, right? They see the, the spreads that, that just don't exist in traditional asset classes. Um, you know, and they can drive a truck through these opportunities in terms of what they're seeing, right? So, uh, you know, there is a lot of appetite. I think that it's probably accelerated even further with the, with the launch of a couple of large funds that have gone first. Everybody wants to see others, you know, you know, first over the line or over the top. Uh, and so I think it's providing a lot of confidence, um, you know, for, for traditional hedge funds and, and asset managers to put five, seven, ten percent of their portfolios into this kind of, uh, you know, crypto and digital trading space. I mean, those are big numbers. I mean, if we think about 10%, I mean, just to put things in perspective for our audience, the total crypto, sorry, the total hedge fund AUM right now is around $4 trillion. So if we're talking about, if we're talking 10% or 7%, and these are very big amounts, which will be a, a pretty much like a, a, a hundred X what the, the size of the crypto hedge fund industry is today. Actually, uh, James, you know, obviously at uh, in my role at PwC, I had the chance of actually work for that report that we published together for many years now. Um, I'd say it's been very, very exciting from the year one. I remember I was in the Elwood offices uh, four years ago trying to, when we came up with an idea. Uh, so it's incredible how that crypto hedge fund report now has become a big, uh, big deal in, in the market. So very exciting to see that still going on uh, on, on that perspective. Um, you know, but obviously hedge funds have a big role to play and I agree with you I think that there's a lot of uh, upside from here I always say if the traditional hedge fund industry is 4 trillion and let's say there's 10% you, you you mentioned that's 400 billion and today according to the last official data there's only 4 billion in, in a crypto hedge fund AUM so there's 100x right now growth and I mean for anybody who's looking at the sector that's fabulous growth that, that may take place over the next uh, couple of months or in years um, I, I just want to ask you about also other market participants as well you know when we talk about healthy financial markets there's a lot of other players there's obviously hedge funds but there's a high frequency flir- high frequency firms there's the market makers and the likes what do you think are the, the the role that what are the other participants that you want to see more involved in broader crypto markets that you think will make not only markets more liquid but also healthier and more transparent and more uh, more interesting and more institutional from that perspective? Look, I think there are a few points, and and it's a really good question as this sort of you know raises its maturity uh, levels further. I, I think market data is a big point um, that that's generally missed here. You know the, the the need for for strong market data is going to be essential for more institutional flow and activity. People need to back test. They need historics. They want to model. They're used to doing that in all the other asset classes. So to get comfortable trading at any real speed and any real velocity and in, in the HF world and that high frequency ecosystem, like they need to be able to historically model. So you know that I think you know strong and solid market data will become an essential part of of the fabric of uh, of the go forward. Um, that also helps with reference data you know, points as well. You know, we know this is a 24 hour a day market, like traditional finance people are looking for a marker, um, you know, so they're looking for a NAV price, you know, all these, again, simple kind of things that we take for granted and have done for, for 15 or 20 years, you know, again, a, a big opportunities for this market to evolve. So how do people price their book? When do they price their book? How do they collect that market, market data feeds and structures? And then to your point, you know, market making, like we want depth of book, like we all want, you know, mass liquidity. What, what we don't want is shallow liquidity, you know, with big care orders that are being sucked up and, and, and you know, unable to be filled. So I think there's a, there's a need for more market making, which I think will be a great opportunity. You know, the market makers in this space are super, you know, sharp, which is great. I think we'll see more institutional flow there, but there'll also be losers, um, you know, there will be people that enter this space with a market making expectation that it's the same as other traditional assets that will lose their share, right? And that's the beauty of a, of a free flowing capital market. Um, but I think that we'll, we'll see a lot more engagement in, in real market making. The depth of book, I think, is going to be essential. And also, you know, and, and I'm not a naysayer of, uh, of lots of kind of coins and tokens in a big, big universe. I, I'm, I'm a believer. But equally, there will be some rationalization, right? You know, because that, again, has to happen to enable full kind of transparency and institutional flow. So wide expanse, you know, slight rationalization, larger institutional flow, depth of book, uh, and a solid foundation of, of infrastructure, I think, are the recipes for success. 
And, and you know, uh, when uh, obviously these are very interesting uh, elements, right? You mentioned obviously there's a lot of coins out there, and we need liquidity. What do you think is going to happen when we look at the broader uh, crypto markets? Do you think obviously there is there are issues right now with market integrity? For example, like insider trading, uh, information not being publicly available, uh, frankly, wash trading, uh, fake volumes. How do you think the industry is going to deal with these issues, and wh- how do you think we'll we'll be dealing with these issues moving forward? Well, look, I think we've you know we've gone through this so far, and we haven't used the word regulation, but I think that you know I, I've I've skirted with it with standardization, but I, like I think that the regulation is is a necessity. It's a uh, it's an enabler, you know, done and done and delivered in the right way, um, you know. And again, I don't mean to sound trite with that, but it's a true enabler for this market. I, I think you're right. I think there's there's still a lot of sensitivity, concern, and um, you know, and conspiracy around, you know, front running trades and um, the, you know the inability to be able to wash trade or the ability to wash trade. And I think the regulator helps. You know, they help with you know, smart order routing or best available execution, all those sorts of standards that we brought in through MIFID, um, you know, over the years. I think we're now starting to see, I mean, it was it was a public statement, you know, Gary Gensler making some some very kind of visible public statements about, you know, is it a security or not? And I think, again, it, we understand the rules from the road and I think that will help us. It will iron out some of these, these challenges. It will also shake out some of the weevils. Um, you know, through the ship's biscuit. But the reality is, I think we need some of this. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want to necessarily go far to the right of this world and, and make it a sort of untradable asset. But I think having a framework allows us all to operate in a fashion in which we can, you know, truly maximize the volume. You know, I want to ask you about the state of markets today, but before that, there's one more question I'll ask you. Obviously, you just mentioned right now about the, the, the need the need for regulations. How do you think, obviously, there's a big uh, unknown, the big elephant in the room there is that everything's happening with decentralized finance. How do you think that's going to happen? How do you think that interaction is going to happen between, you know, centralized uh, crypto trading, if we want to call it like that, and the whole DeFi universe? Will they merge? Will they cohabitate? Uh, will one help the other? What's your view on that? Look, I think there's a maturity curve, you know, on, on central versus decentral, um, you know, from a, from a, you know, an opportunity and an engagement standpoint. I think it's far easier, clearly, for the regulator to involve themselves on a centralized, um, you know, landscape, you know, makes sense. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity in the stablecoin ecosystem, which, you know, obviously is now being, um, you know, kind of mobilized. I think it will have to happen in phases. I still think there's a, there's a good and a big role for DeFi. I think there's, there's good opportunities and there are also great participants, um, you know, in that ecosystem as well. I don't think there's, you know, there's all, you know, we hear the stories of the, of the one bad actor. You know, what we don't hear is the, is the multi-million uh, users that are obviously good actors in this environment too. I think there's a great opportunity for, uh, for, for DeFi to play a good role in all the right facets that we, we know and love, which are, you know, enabling the creator to, to, you know, retain control. Uh, and I think that that has a long road. Um, I think institutional involvement in DeFi is probably the, the 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 sort of slower end of that. I think that you know there's still a lot of reticence and lack of understanding in DeFi, um, and so I think that protracts the timing of which institutions get involved in that asset class. But I think they start central. That's our journey for the next thirty six months or more, and then in parallel we're able to sort of understand the landscape of DeFi and materialize it, and then hopefully that then gives us another opportunity. I love it that, you know, when we're talking about even the, the big innovation that's like these, we're talking about 36 months, which in traditional finance, that's like a very, very short term. It's incredible how things uh, operate. Last question, James, actually about the markets. You know, when we look at the crypto market, the city of crypto markets today, a lot of signals make us, you know, lead us towards a bear market. What's your view on the markets? Do you think we've hit bottom? Where do you think we are in that life cycle of it? And is it a bear market? How long will it last? Just keen to get your views on that perspective. Well, look, you know, not no investment advice from from me, but the, you know, my my view uh, is very much that um, I'm I'm confident about the response that that we've seen um, across crypto and digital. Um, you know, in line with the market, you know, changes and challenges. You know, obviously, if you look at how it's pegged itself against tech stocks in equities, you know, it's it's actually fared very, you know, fed relatively well. Um, and I think everybody had this mass expectation that, that crypto and digital would crater. You know, Apple goes down by 5%. Should crypto go down by, you know, 75%? 
And I think that also helps us with, you know, the risk weighted asset question mark that the regulators asking. It didn't crater. Like the whole world didn't end in, in digital and crypto. And in fact, it paired itself relatively well. And obviously that's a broad statement um, to the change in, in balance of, of the tech stocks in equity. So I think that that gives some comfort to the regulator as they're, you know, opining and, and making decisions on, on what percentages to, a, you know, apportion for RWAs. Um, have we reached the bottom? Look, there, there are there are always going to be you know further bubbles uh, and further you know spikes and, and troughs that we're going to have, but I think we'll see it in correlation um, to the macro you know environment as opposed to it being a standalone asset class that, that kind of you know trades away than 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 current kind of uh, you know market participants. So um, you know long winded way of basically saying I, I think there's a positive future. I actually think this was a good experience, wildly painful for a lot of people on this podcast, I'm sure. Um, but actually, if you're a believer in the asset class, you're here for the long run, right? So so I think we've got a long way of positive to come. Here we go. James, uh, to wrap this up, my the bell is back with me. I'm asking quick questions. I need one or two word answers, quick answers. Uh, and then we're going to go rapidly on that perspective. And the bell will keep us uh, honest here. Are you ready? But when you are. Excellent. That's what I love to hear. James, uh, what do you do on weekends when you're not uh, busy in crypto? Ah, uh, looking after children. <laughs> what is the one thing that shocked you the most when you entered the crypto space? Uh, the distinct lack of immaturity on the infrastructure. Yeah, of course. Uh, what is one book or resource, resource you recommend people if they want to learn about crypto? Oh, clearly your book. This is the only one. <laughs> this was not planned, by the way. This was not planned. The question. I appreciate those support. Um, what uh, you know? What is the if you could hire one traditional hedge fund manager as an intern, a traditional hedge fund manager as an, as your intern to in crypto? Who would you want to hire? Well, look, I have a great boss in Alan Howard, and I would never have him as my intern. Um, but maybe Lewis Bacon just to annoy Alan. <laughs> Here we go. What is the one crypto CEO uh, in the one one crypto CEO that impresses you the most? Uh, it's got to be Sam Banks. Yeah, no, you know, no, no, no from the future. Yeah, I have to say, very impressive uh, young man. What is the one traditional financial institution, traditional financial institution that impresses you the most for what they're doing in crypto? Uh, Goldman Sachs. Interesting. Why is that? Uh, I believe they have a they they have a vision and they're willing to commit to the vision. Amazing! What is your one advice uh, to anyone who wants to get started in crypto? Look as much reading as you can. Use your money. You know, bet bet with your money and and get involved in the asset class. There you go. If you had to bet, uh, is Satoshi Nakamoto a man, a woman, or what country is he or she from? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I definitely say a woman, um, far more, you know, IQ and EQ combined, uh, and understand the value proposition. Um, I, look, country, hard one to call, Ma you know, maybe the Isle of Wight. <laughs> Love it. And to finish it all, again, James, great to have you with us today. If you could have lunch or dinner with one person, lunch or dinner with one person, uh, who, who, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, it's got to be Winston Churchill. Wow, interesting. Why is that? If you don't want me asking, look, what leadership skills? What 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 vision? You know, in face of adversity, to you know, to be to have conviction in their their opinion and view. Love it, loathe it, agree or disagree, but the conviction was uh, was quite something. Love it, love it, James. James, where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you, find out more about you, and uh, how can they? Where can they find you? Look, so uh, we're www.elwood.io. Um, so, you know, obviously come come visit us. Uh, we'd love to be helpful. We, we're trying to educate as much as we're trying to, you know, evolve the market. Love it. Guys, that was James Tickland, the CEO of Elwood Technologies. Thank you very much for listening to this, another episode of uh, the Future of Money podcast. Again, make sure to click subscribe and give us a five-star rating if you don't mind. It will really help uh, the more people discover the show. If you don't want to stay on top of the latest developments on crypto and the future of money, uh, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, you know where I, I share my, not only my weekly crypto capsule, but a lot of the other content that we have now in multiple languages. And again, if you want to learn more, uh, James uh, kindly uh, encouraged that the 
uh, gave us a, his own five star rating on it. Uh, but really, if you're interested in my latest book, The Book of Crypto, thank you for making it the number one new release. Thank you for making a bestseller. A lot of work and effort and, and uh, went into it, but I hopefully it can, it can prove valuable to many of you. The Book of Crypto available uh, either on Amazon or uh, with my publisher, Palgrave uh, Springer, available online as well. Well, thank you very much, everybody. James, thank you again for joining us uh, this week on the Future of Money podcast. And thank you, everybody at home. And see you all next time. <laughs>